how well is this all going to play in front of a jury eventually when we get there? Because, I mean, the, the, the truth of, of the matter and, and everything we've been arguing about that is just flat out, you know, just reality. Uh, here's what was done wrong. Here's how the investigation was inaccurate. Here's what was presented to the judge that was inaccurate. I mean, a lot of things can come out just straight out to the jury that are just simply facts. Whether Judge Gull wanted to hear them or not, they will eventually make it out there. Um, number one, you have to rely on a jury that's going to understand what the hell is going on in all this because it's so deep. I mean, we get it. We're in that world every day. But if you're just right. like on the outside looking in, it's a it's a sea of mess, and you don't know where to even begin to try and, and understand or comprehend the path that this thing has gone down. Um, with all the missteps here and, and all of the just bizarre, you know, rulings from Gull, um, how is that going to play out in the, in, in the courtroom when Gull is proceeding over this very trial where a lot of, I think, these, these missteps are going to be brought up? Yeah, and it's it's one of those things that that what you hope is going to happen at trial is the procedural issues that that we've all seen and and been talking about for months now, in theory have no place in the trial itself. You know, yeah. so th they're not going to be able to bring up the fact that you know the attorneys were removed and that they were reinstated because the Supreme Court said that the judge was you know, you know, way beyond her discretion in terms of removing them. Like th those aren't going to be things that are going to be able to be addressed at trial, that the trial is going to be limited to the facts and the evidence mm -hmm. and whatever the judge is deemed admissible, that'll get in. The, the, the question then becomes, have any of the attorneys, the state or the defense had enough time uh, knowing that this thing is prepared to go to trial uh, in just about a month? Um, are they prepared to yeah. put this, like you said, a, a case that has so many just tentacles, are they going to be able to put forth a cogent case where a jury who may not have any knowledge of the case at all, yeah. or the underlying facts or the Frank's memo or the PCA mm -hmm. that was put out by the state. And they're just like fresh unmolded pieces of clay are they, are they going to be able to either side be able to put on a cogent case yeah. so that a jury can make heads or tails of what the hell is going on i don't know man yeah. you know it's like like I, I battle in my mind whether if i'm the defense if if i'm filing a motion to continue it and, and only they know because they're the ones who are preparing for it i mean if you get to be three weeks out and you're you're looking at your case and you're like oh my god you know, there, there's so much here that, you know, we haven't been able to get our experts paid and we haven't been able to get the, the information to them to, to review it and prepare reports and, and inform us as to the way to question a DNA expert, the, the questions that, that we should ask their expert, the questions we should ask you, you know, the geofencing stuff. You know, it's like you, you need your experts to be able to to look at that stuff and explain it to lawyers that that's why we hire expert witnesses, not only to explain it to a jury, but to explain it to the attorneys themselves. I mean, I, I'm no expert in any scientific field. Mm -hmm. I always relied on, on experts to explain things to me so that I had an understanding of what the hell I was talking about. So I could try to ask proper questions both on direct examination and cross-examination. So, man, you got so many things going on with this thing. Um, you know, the hope is, is that really for the girls and for Richard Allen, that that everybody's prepared, mm -hmm. at least in the sense that we're going to get a fair trial. Because, again, if this thing shakes out and it's just hot garbage, wherein both sides don't seem prepared to be at trial, we're going to be getting a redo. Yeah. You know, and, and no one wants that. No one wants the family members of the victims. They have to sit through this thing again to go through this thing again, you know, and and because that just means more time. Like the appeal, you know, that the, the victim's families are sitting there if he's convicted, you know, just waiting for the other shoe to drop from the appellate court. Oh, my God, are they going to get another trial? and We have to go through this all again. You know, it's it's like a it's like torturous. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, I, I can't even begin to understand what it would feel like to have lost one of my kids in that way and, and have to keep reliving this nightmare over yeah. and over and over. 
So, you know, I mean, we'll see how it's going to play out, man. I'm, I'm, um, I'm nervous about the whole thing. You know, it's like I've, I've said when we've talked on other occasions, you know, that, that speedy trial demand is very much a, a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. And when you've got just the issues of the magnitude that are going on in this case, and, and we know that the defense is going to be putting on an alternate suspect defense. I mean, that's a lot of work, man, you know, and it's like, you're, you're going to be hearing in, in its essence, two separate cases. You're going to be hearing the state's case, which is that Richard Allen is the guy. And this is the evidence that we have of it. And then you're going to be hearing in the defensive side of it. We think it's these guys, Mm -hmm. these, and this is the evidence that we have that it's these guys you know, so like you're talking about two separate trials on top of the attacks that are going to be taking place on law enforcement, law enforcement's investigation into this and, mm-hmm. and how shoddy it may have been. And, you know, that we can't trust that evidence. It's just it is a huge amount to prepare for. So, you know, like for for everybody involved, I'm, I'm nervous about this thing going in a, in a month, man, because it's just. It's a lot to handle. Refresh me on this. There's no cameras in the courtroom for this, right? Not so far. I mean, she can always change her mind. I mean, there's certainly a lot of pressure uh, on her from a lot of different, a lot of different angles coming at her saying, you know, that this thing should be televised, you know, for transparency sake, you know, in my position on it is especially in light of everything that has gone on. Yeah. Like I can't think of a case that, that really, deserves to be needs to be broadcast to the public more than this case yeah you know it, it's just it, it's the case that that has been in in i love it in 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 the sense that it has brought forth procedural issues that the true crime community typically is not looking at mm-hmm. you know we have gone on through our lives watching true crime content for years having no idea little to no idea what happens pre-trial and yeah. i've been saying since i've become a creator on my podcast and then and more recently on youtube that look the real wars in any case are fought during this time and yeah. now people are seeing it firsthand People are shocked by it, mm-hmm. but th- this is where the battles are fought. This yeah. is where what evidence is going to get in, what evidence is going to be kept out. You know, this is where you see all that happening. And, and now it's becoming commonplace. We're seeing it in the Idaho four case. We're mm-hmm. seeing all the pre-trial battles and wars that go on between the state and the defense. We're seeing it in Delphi. We're seeing it in Karen Reed. That did not exist prior to this. Mm-hmm. When you look at court TV, they did not show pre-trial hearings mm-hmm. ever you know now they're commonplace and as a is an attorney i love it because this is showing the american people what the process really is yeah. and you know and beyond that it's also showing the people what i've been screaming from the rooftops again since i started making content which is look the way that the the, the process has worked the criminal justice system has worked forever is that the state gets their theory thrown out there always mm-hmm. ahead of time, which is incredibly prejudicial because it, it's typically not countered. Mm-hmm. Typically, the defense isn't able to get their theory of the case. And remember, it's just theories. This is not tested evidence. Yeah. When you see a probable cause affidavit, that is not vetted, tested evidence. That is evidence that was collected by law enforcement that has not been vetted at trial, or meaning that, that witnesses are put under cross-examination to see whether or not they're reliable, to see if the evidence collected, if it was collected properly, does it does it mean what the state says that it means? Mm-hmm. Like all those things have to happen in trial and it's the only place that it can happen. So what you've seen here, especially in Karen Reed and especially in Delphi, are those two things, that the defense in both those cases has gotten their theory of defense out and you have seen two camps just divide. Yeah. Like in like unlike in any other case, like Kohlberger to a little bit of a, the same extent, but not to the extent that Karen Reed and and Delphi are, where you've got these two camps and, and both that are saying he's guilty or he's innocent should both not be saying that. We have to wait until trial. None of us know. Mm-hmm. You can certainly have a feeling that I think that the evidence that they're saying that they have 
leans guilty. I think that he's guilty based on what he said, but I'm reserving my final judgment until trial happens. And same with the people that are claiming he's innocent. We yeah. can't know until trial happens, period. But but I, I like I love this concept because it really does even the playing field. But it, it's it's blown people's minds. Mm -hmm. You know, people are so unaccustomed to hearing the defense getting their theory out pre-trial that it, it's 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 made people feel uncomfortable with the situation. And it shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. The state shouldn't be the ones to be able to just get their their theory out because yeah. it's highly prejudicial. Everyone that hears one side of a story is, of course going to think that that person is guilty because it's unchecked yeah it's just out there look this is all the evidence we have without it ever being tested until trial and and of course that's going to prejudice the jury so i like i i love the fact that it's gone down this way as a defense attorney because i really do believe it creates a, a more even playing field going into trial hey thanks for checking out the video be sure to follow us wherever you download podcasts and especially apple podcasts where you can get advanced episode and premium content on our premium channel right there also be sure to follow us on social media so you don't miss any breaking updates on the stories that matter to you most we're on tiktok x instagram facebook just search hidden killers podcast with tony brewski and you'll find us right there again thanks for watching